Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you're only in town every so often. And I know last time your schedule was just packed. Everybody is trying to get you into their spaces, but it's because of what you bring. Let's talk a bit about your background, which is so extensive. I mean, you've done a lot. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm 90, so I have done a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, my education is typical for, well, not so typical. I come into education at a time where there's still segregation. I live in the North, so it's a different type of segregation. I can be more specific. I wanted to do industrial psychology, which was a terminal master's degree at that time. The dominant universities um, did not want a large number of blacks in those programs. So what they said was, you have to do a practicum that is one year. But when you went to do the practicum or get someplace to accept you, you'd have practicums for white students from the ceiling to the floor. None of these companies would accept you as a black. So instead of the university saying, we, we'll find you a program, we'll do something, they said, it would be unfair for us to accept you for a program in which you could not complete the requirements for graduation which was a very nice way of saying, we don't want you, we're not gonna help you out. So what traditionally was done in the early part of the century, of last century, and up to even now, uh, when you can't get into programs, your parents send you abroad. Mm. So the leading country at that time for industrial psychology was Germany. And I was sent to Professor Kretschmer at Tübingen in 1955. And I did my practicum at Mercedes-Benz and Zeiss Icon, the camera company. So you can't beat those two. Wow. And when I came back, for some strange reason, I was still black and they didn't hire me. But uh, I don't know why. I thought they could tell by my long blonde hair and light blue eyes I had changed. But, uh, <laughs> so I went and I did my doctorate at Innsbruck under Kohler and in Austria. And when I came back, I went to apply for a job. I was asked to apply at uh, General Motors College in Flint, Michigan. My home is Detroit. I drove up. And when I got there, the man had seen all my papers, but he hadn't seen me. And when I got out of the car, he was a little hesitant. And we said, how do you do? And then after I'd gone through all my papers, all excited, oh, wonderful, wonderful, I want to get to do. And I said, well, is there something missing? Is there something else you need? He said, uh, no, you have everything I wanted more than I could have hoped for. But you know, you should not have applied. You're a Negro, wow. just like that. So it's been a long struggle, okay? But that's the existentialistic reality. And to all the young people today, you don't quit, you don't give up, you don't let them destroy you, you just keep pushing and eventually you get what you need. Well, you have done just that. I mean, mm. the, the ways that you've been able to take your studies and really be such a pioneer when we talk about the ways that we deal with certain things. I mean, you're sitting here and you can tell, you know, we're talking about homelessness here and the mm -hmm. approach to it. Uh, we're talking about how these progressives in Seattle see themselves. And I know uh, through your study, you really have a, a, a grand understanding of, you know, the cultures and how they build relationships and how they deal with certain things. Tell us a little bit about that, because I was blown away by some of the things that you shared the last time you were uh, in Seattle. Well, um, because of my training, I'm also, I'm a psychologist. So I look at things as a psychologist, but because of the European training, I look also to classical philosophy. And when you look at ethnic groups, you don't always look at them in a minus or negative way. You want to see what are the strengths and the positives of that group. But not just one group, it's for each group, what are the strengths and the positives. And what I found is that the European culture is primarily focused on objects. And that's because of this very scarcity of survive of what to survive in ancient Europe. There was always not enough food, not enough this, not enough that, and people died. So in order to make sure that you have enough, then the acquisition of objects 
and that could be politics or any other number of things, not just material objects, um, is the highest value. And for us as African Americans, this is also true for Latinx and also true for Afro-Arabs. Mm. The highest value is in the relationship. And if you understand that the highest value is in the relationship, it says that as a group of people, we see ourselves to be equal to each other. And that's because there's no scarcity in those countries like in Africa and so on. Mm. All right? That this food all the time. It's not nine months from growing. It's always there. So the idea is then if it's not scarcity and food and all these things you're struggling for, then what do you do? You establish relationships to maintain order with by giving people. Now here's the part that you really need to look at carefully. If we see ourselves as equal and you do something that treats me as less than equal. You have treated me with disrespect. And that destroys the relationship. So last century, Aretha Franklin, Aretha Franklin said a song. And what was her song? Respect. Respect, yes. So it's that powerful in our culture. In Asian culture, the highest value is in the cohesiveness of the group. So if you look at traditional Asian culture, people function in the workplace and other places as a group. And the group must come to a consensus. So you can't just say that that's the Asian group and are you the boss of the Asian group, then you tell them what to do. It doesn't work that way. Before, before you can say, 10 of us are coming to your meeting, the person you assume to be in charge has to go and get a consensus from each of the persons saying, yes, I will be there at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. And once they have a consensus, they come together as a cohesive group, and the spokesperson says, we will be there Tuesday at 10 o'clock, and all of them will be there Tuesday at 10 o'clock. So these are axiologies. These are value systems of different cultures. When you understand them and you respect them, then you can uh, do the things you need to do. One other, you have a large population of Native Americans out here. Well, the highest value for the Native American is oneness with the Great Spirit. So a lot of the activities that they do, just routine activities, are, are prayerful activities. There's a constant set of prayers that go. Not fixed prayers, but prayerfulness, or the presence of prayer. I have um, a friend... Um, her name is Victoria, Native American, long hair. And in the morning, when she's plaiting her hair, she's saying prayers, almost like a rosary. So it's that very close connection, constantly in what you're doing. And you are in nature. You're looking to see what is it in the nature that brings me closer to the oneness with God. Wow. Okay. Well, yeah, absolutely. This is the stuff that I think so many of us need to understand when we're crafting certain solutions around right. uh, right. the voids that we see in our world. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, you get to go all over the world and really share so much of what you've gained. You have your business that does so. But tell us about how your presence and what you bring into spaces, you know, just was with you this weekend at the Anti-Racist Training People's Institute. Shout out to People's Institute doing great work. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're always entering these spaces and bringing this wealth of knowledge uh, what is some of the things that you're really hoping people understand after they've had a session with you and they've mm -hmm. been able to now take this back into their organization or institution um, and, and change the way maybe that they're doing things? Well, if we don't understand each other culturally, then we will not survive the 21st century as a first-class power. Globalization is a reality. We are in competition with all of the countries around the world. And the number one competition that we have is China. So all of these countries and our country, we are a multi-ethnic, pluralistic, and linguistically diverse society. 
And that means that we have people from every place in the world, every thought process, every way of reasoning, we have right here, which reflects the world. So if we're going to interact with the world, then we need to utilize all the people that we have to do that interaction. So the, 19, the, the 20th century, we had a vertical hierarchical organizational structure. You had a boss and somebody, the boss moved up and you, he liked you and you were loyal, you'd move up. That system crashed. It doesn't exist anymore. Now we have what is called team. You work on a team. That's the unit of production. The unit of production is team. We know from the major work of Scott Page that homogeneous teams, all white male teams, start a project, but when it's compared to a heterogeneous team, males, females, all part of the multi-ethnic pluralistic society, those teams are more creative and productive. So if you can't get your act together and work with people who are different, respect and stay on the team, then you won't be on a team and you won't have a job. My goodness. This is exactly, I mean, you're, you're giving us the, the, the academic foundation of what I'm saying when we talk about a holistic approach. That's it. Right. That's I mean, it. Yeah. we, we say this oftentimes in community, but I, I promise you when you come back, I need to do a full in-depth one-on-one -on -one with you because there's so much here that lies underneath the surface. And it's one of those things that I know so many of us could be benefiting from, uh, you know, as, as folks are probably now going to be researching you and finding out how to connect with you, okay. let them know your website and, and let them know how they can connect with you. Well, uh, my website is uh, ejnichols.com. Uh, and um, you can go on YouTube and you'll see things on YouTube that will help you to better understand what I, what I try to convey and what I try to work at. And if you have questions, um, I'm listed so they can find me, okay? Oh, Dr. Nichols, it is just my pleasure, even for a sliver of your time today, to share with our audience. Uh, you really just gave me so much <laughs> light right then in that moment. Thank you so much for being You're with me You're very today. welcome, and I thank you for inviting me. And um, I'm really very proud of the work that you're doing here and your motto here, Black Media Managers. Yeah. So it does, and thank you. Absolutely. That means the world coming from you.